Welcome to the Borderless Podcast, your guide to traveling, investing, and living beyond borders, where we talk about living the life that you want to live where you want to live it. From beautiful San Miguel de Allende, smack in the middle of Mexico, with your hosts, Jonathan Lockwood and James Guzman. Welcome to the Borderless Podcast, traveling, investing, and living beyond borders. This is a podcast that tries to help you live the life of your dreams. The life you want, the life you create, not one inside the box, but outside of the box. Location-independent businesses, living internationally, all of that stuff. I'm Jonathan Lockwood. We're coming to you from uh, the borderless compound here in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico, and I'm with James Guzman. Hey, James. Hey, Jonathan. How are you doing? Doing good. What's new with you? Oh, just doing well. You know, it's a great uh, day here in San Miguel de Allende. It's uh, beautiful outside, and uh, it's been really enjoying myself. So Right. So how did you meet... Ravoye Morik. Well, Am I saying that right? Yeah. Morik? Yeah. Okay. How did you meet him? Yeah. So uh, we actually contacted, he contacted me on the internet. Uh, he was familiar with the, the podcast and all that kind of stuff. He's kind of doing a similar thing. Uh, it's more focused on geopolitics out uh, from uh, Guadalajara. And so... Um, so he you know, contacted you through the website? Yeah, exactly. Oh, cool. And well, he's coming into town. So okay. we just uh, hooked up yesterday and we did a video and I thought I'd... Uh, Bring him into the studio here. Well, how nice that his bio is reasonably short here, <laughs> unlike most that we get. So, uh, Urvoye, Urvoye Morik is a humanities teacher and adjunct professor of international relations at Tecnológico de Monterrey. He obtained a Master of International Relations from the Geneva School of Diplomacy and a Bachelor of Arts in History and Secondary Education from Northeastern Illinois University. He has served as a volunteer with Peace Corps Mongolia and also worked as an assistant with the mission of the Czech Republic to the United Nations. His research interests include geopolitics and global governance. Welcome, Mervoye, to the Borderless Podcast. Thanks. It's good to be here at the compound, the Borderless <laughs> Compound. You have, bet it. Have you been enjoying uh, San Miguel? It's an amazing, amazing place. Yeah. It's, a, it's m much cooler than, than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys went to the uh, hot springs today, right? How's yeah, that? We went to the hot, hot springs. Uh, really nice. Relaxed there and good food, the good restaurants. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if a lot of people don't know that, but there's some beautiful hot springs here in San Miguel de Allende. They've got about five different ones and they're natural hot springs, really beautiful, warm water. So it's a great way to spend a a day out there. You know? Which one did you go to? Escon Escondido. Escondido. Yeah, I hear that's a nice one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So where are you from originally, Ervoye? So I was, I was born in Chicago, uh -huh. uh, but my parents were from Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. Croatia. And every year we'd go to Croatia and, and I went there for fifth grade and for high school. So we'd move back and forth. My father had the crazy idea to, in 1994, to move back to Croatia during the war. Mm. So... <laughs> We just uh, we felt the tail end of the war, and then we moved back to the States. I got my history degree in Chicago. And then around 2005, I, I decided I had enough of the U.S. and looked for, for a way out. I was going to pull a Brad Pitt uh, seven years in Tibet type thing. <laughs> yeah. And then um, I was looking into going into Tibet, but then I, I saw it with the paperwork and all of that, it, it's not quite, it's, it's, it's not easy. And then I discovered the Peace Corps. And I, I, I found out that they, they basically, you choose pretty much where you want to go and they pay your way. Uh, they give you a monthly uh, uh, salary, stipend, and they have an amazing, one of the best uh, language uh, programs. Yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting. I think a lot of people probably haven't thought about that, you know, doing the Peace Corps. But I want to kind of back up for a second. Uh -huh. You said in 2005, yeah. you uh, felt like you, I think you said you had it or something. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. So, uh, so what does that mean? I mean, what was it specifically that, that made you not want to be in the States anymore? Well, so I finished my history degree, and so I was studying a lot of history and, and politics, and just taking a look around the U.S. culturally, socially, politically, economically, I was discovering, you know, the economy was on a permanent decline. We were mm -hmm. about to peak, and this was right before the, the housing crisis. Mm -hmm. right. and I was going around telling everyone, you know, there's going to be this huge crisis, and people thought, thought you think you're crazy, you know? And so I saw that... U.S. was peaking economically, politically. I didn't like what was going on, uh, and culturally as well, because I, I would look around at all of my peers, my friends, and they weren't really advancing. They'd just be talking about sports and, and being very pr promiscuous and all of this stuff, while I was becoming more spiritual and and you know I wanted to do other things. And I'm just like, you know, I got nothing here, and 
Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go see the world. All right. So cool. So then you uh, join the Peace Corps. I mean, how does that? How do you go about doing that? Is it kind of like signing up for the military or something? You just walk into the office and do an application, and they accept you, or it's it's similar to the military. Yeah. John F. Kennedy founded it in 1961, mm -hmm. and basically, you go into the offices, you do uh, an interview. And they see, you know, if you fit the profile and usually if you have a bachelor's degree, they'll take you. Sometimes uh, you might be able to get away without having a bachelor's degree and you do the interview and then it depends on, on the person you're with. But you might get to choose geographically where you'd like to go. Right. But you I, might not. Right. They might send you. They might send in the you. desert in a tent. Yes, well, I, I, I chose to go there. So. Oh, you yeah. did? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not too many people probably is Mongolia first on their list. Yeah, right? I, no, right. I don't think so. So that was where you wanted to go? Well, actually, first I wanted to come here to Latin America, mm -hmm. to Mexico, oh, right. but you had to speak Spanish. Oh. And then I, I like the Middle East. I, I wanted to go to Jordan, but you had to wait, I had to wait six months. And so I was like, no, I got to get out of Dodge now. And I saw this great uh, documentary by this Croatian filmmaker called Genghis Blues mm. about Central Asia, and I fell in love with Mongolia. Oh, well, that's right. cool. Uh, so how does that work uh, w when you do get sent to a place like that? Mm -hmm. um, I suppose you, get a, uh, you also get a salary. Well, not really. So you sign up. It's for two years. Mm -hmm. And the first 11 weeks, first three months, they give you language training, which is excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, and then after that language training, they send you out for two years at your post and you get like a, a salary, which is enough for you to live in, uh, depending on the country you're right. in. And at, and at the end of your two years, you get maybe $7,000, hmm. you know, just to get started again. So in Mongolia, I was living in the desert. I got like a hundred, 120 bucks a month. Oh. And I was able to live just fine on $120 a month. I got everything I needed. Wow. Yeah. That sounds better than Chiang Mai, right. where all these guys are going. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. So, but you enjoyed it. Yeah, I was in a, in a village of a, less than 1,000 people in a yurt or, or ger, as they call it, they've tr that they've traditionally lived in for 1,000 years in minus 20, 30 degrees. You get used to it, you know? So, so what were you doing there? I was teaching English. So when you go into the Peace Corps, depending on your background, you could work in medicine, um, teaching, in business. If you have some business experience, you mm -hmm. can use that with the local community. Uh, and, there was, and there's a lot of interesting, interesting things that can happen. There was one guy who he worked, he had an idea. They had these rural banks all over Mongolia in the villages. And there was no internet in the villages. And the banks had internet. And his idea was to siphon the internet from the bank and create internet uh, cafes for the people in the villages. Mm -hmm. And the bank loved that idea. And when he got out of the Peace Corps, he continued working for the bank uh, in Mongolia. Mm. And then la later that led him to many other opportunities. Yeah, yeah well that, I mean, that's interesting. I don't know um, anything about Mongolia. You know, I have heard people like Jim Rogers say that yeah. there's a lot of opportunities and stuff. I mean, it was a while ago. When, when did you leave? 2007? Something yeah, like I that? was there in 2007. Seven. Uh, so that was probably a while ago. I mean, did you see what, what they were talking about as far as, do you think it's a place that it's good for maybe someone to go check out or expatriate to or something like that? Yeah, I mean, you have to approach it with, with caution. I know a few years ago, the Mongolian Tugrik, their currency, mm. was the highest performing currency in the world. Mm. And that was a few years ago. And they have about a trillion dollars worth of minerals. Right, which averages out if you know if each citizen if that was divided by each citizen, each citizen would theoretically get three hundred and thirty three thousand uh, dollars. But you know that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would definitely recommend Mongolia. I actually I'd like to go back there someday in the future. Um, the re there's the real estate market is is doing pretty well in Ulaanbaatar, the the capital, um, and it's growing. It's an emerging market. They're making deals with Russia and China. And, you know, the East right now is is rising. They got these big energy deals and the Silk Road that China's building. And right. just that whole area is a great place to be. And Mongolia, you know, you have the real estate opportunities. You can go and teach if you want, open businesses. I think a lot of the, the bank accounts there, you can get some really uh, good um, interest rates on savings accounts, like 13 14 15%. It's really? the highest in the world. Yeah. Wow. 
Yeah, I'm not sure about in that. Local but, currency, yeah. But yeah, I think yeah, I you don't didn't know. have much money to put in the bank on 120 bucks a month. Didn't you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, that is incredible. I mean, how cheap were things if you could live on that? I don't see how. I mean, well, but they, they they give you food and they give you a tent. And then, well, the, the tent was paid for. You can buy your own tent for five hundred bucks well, or a thousand. Thanks for that. You know, they give you a tent at least. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's enough to get the food in the village. Obviously, in the city, things are more expensive. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, cool. So then you signed it. It was just a two-year contract, right? I, I left after a year. I had a bit of a personal uh-huh. experiences. Uh, I decided to do something else. Right. And my one, crit- you know, I love the Peace Corps. I totally recommend it. But my one of the criticisms was you go out there thinking you're going to save the world. Um, but really, you realize you're barely going to make a dent. Mm. And uh, mm. what I don't like is it costs the American taxpayer $35,000 a year for one Peace Corps volunteer. When um, and you're getting 150 bucks a month. Right. But I mean, the, the point is that 35000 is going into each volunteer right. training and, yeah, and logistics. Yeah. That's a lot of money sure. as opposed to just giving it directly at the local <laughs> level, which, yeah. you know. Good point. So what were you doing? Oh, oh I was teaching English um, at the local school. And, I, you know, I wrote a grant for 500 bucks for the school. Um, just the small stuff like that, you know. Gotcha. So after a year, you decided this seems fruitless. You had the best of intentions, yeah. but you said this isn't right for me. So what did you do then? I went back to the States, um, and then I did more reading and researching. You know, I, I worked at a high school for a while, and I literally spent thousands of dollars on, on Amazon buying books. I still got boxes of books at our house in Croatia and here in Mexico and even back in the States. <laughs> And just discovering more of, of how, how the economy works, how politics work. And then I, my sister finished her bachelor's, and she found this school in Geneva, the Geneva School of Diplomacy. And that's another thing I would recommend to people. If you're going to get a certification or diploma, try to do it as fast as possible. And she found this one-year pro- master's program of international relations. And so off we went. My, my father, which uh, he, he was really awesome, he paid uh, for the both of us to stay in Switzerland for a year and, and for the degree. And uh, we finished in one year. Very good. So yeah. tell, tell us about Switzerland. Yeah, really, really a big difference from Mongolia. You can, <laughs> you can live on 120 bucks in a month in Mongolia. 120 bucks but, an hour in Switzerland. Yeah, th- yeah, don't try that in Switzerland. You, know? you needed like 200 bucks, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and just to compare, when I first came to Mexico out in Guadalajara, I rented a, a two-bedroom house all for myself for 250 bucks a month, which is pretty cheap. Mm-hmm. And in, in Geneva, Switzerland, it's almost $2,000 for a tiny apartment a month. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's really expensive. It's a really nice place to live. And if you kind of want to make it in, in Switzerland, yeah, in my case, when we finished our degree for international relations, uh, you would have to kind of intern or volunteer for six months or a year, uh, you know, network and make contacts. And if you did a good job volunteering in an NGO or international yeah. organization, then you might eventually get a get a job. Okay. Yeah, that's one of the the most expensive places that I've I've been to is Switzerland. I mean, it's, it seems like an interesting place. It's very beautiful. Yeah. Um, lots of uh, interesting history and stuff like that. But number one, it's way too. Uh, expensive for me it was crazy i had to leave early because i just couldn't afford to stay there and went down to italy when i w- went to visit but um also it just uh seemed kind of boring i don't know did you have the, a good the, time there it's just not a lot going on you know that was my next point it was yeah. a bit too sterile for me and right. i like the uh, off the beaten path sort of stuff like here in mexico you know and yeah it's just everything's too perfect for me and it right. gets kind of it's not not as interesting. So you 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 said that your U.S. friends were acting all promiscuous, but you could <laughs> use just a little bit of promiscuousness yeah. <laughs> in Switzerland, and there was none. Right. Okay. Yeah. So tell us about the you know this is just, when we when you when you think about Switzerland, a lot of people think about the banks. Mm-hmm. It, it was known as the most private banking, the place to do banking for years. Is it still the case now? Well, I'm not an expert on that, and I didn't have as much money to put into the banks. But uh, following politics as of late, you can kind of see that in some ways Switzerland has has uh, been pressured by the U.S. And so, the, you know, Washington has pressured them to give up on some 
some secrecy. And on the other hand, we saw them de delink from the, the euro, which was a show of independence. So you, you have, it's a, it's a bit of a compromise in both ways. Um, but yeah, they, they've definitely, it's become less, Less private, less privacy in a sense. Yeah, I mean, there's nowhere on earth anymore that has any sort of private banking. So I don't know that sometimes there are people that try to come in and look for some sort of a, a bank that's going to be numbered or something like that, or um, bear or share corporations. And all that. This stuff just doesn't exist anymore. So, uh, yeah. And, and uh, you know, you guys talk about the FATCA, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think it was the international man, um, Nick, I forget his name. GM Bruno. Yeah. Yeah. GM Bruno who wrote an article about how it's going global pretty much. So in the end, you, you, you might not have anywhere to hide. No, that's definitely right. true. This is not just Switzerland. It's right. just of note because Switzerland was so known yep. to be so private. So even they, you yep. know, and in the presence of it's, you could call it pressure. <laughs> It's pressure also when someone p holds a gun to your head, you yeah. know. I mean, they're, they, they're doing it to everyone, and so everybody is going to have to conform or choose not to have any dealings with the United States financially. Or, or open an account in your backyard, you know. <laughs> Dig a hole. I think that's what James does. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. So, well, that's cool. So, and then um, after Switzerland, that was when you came here to Mexico? Yeah, so I finished my, my thesis, defended it successfully, and then I literally went on the Internet and sent out 100 applications all over the world. Um, 100 applications? I don't know. <laughs> do, do, dozens, dozens. Right. And uh, I decided I didn't want to stay. And, and I saw, you know, the corruption in some of the international organizations. And, mm. and, I, and I, don't want, I didn't want to compromise myself. I wanted to do my own thing. And, um, so if, and if I didn't come to Mexico, I probably would be in the Middle East right yeah. now. Mm. Um, and so... I was looking for jobs and Dave's ESL Cafe. So if anyone wants to look for yeah. teaching gigs, one of the best sites out there, Dave's, Dave's ESL Cafe. Mm -hmm. I found this posting for the Tech de Monterrey. And I had no knowledge of the Tech de Monterrey. And I was like, oh, it's in Mexico. I get to teach international relations. You know, I want to learn Spanish. Tacos are, are good. The Latinas, you yeah. Know, yeah. Are... Let's let's get straight. It's the Latinas. <laughs> yeah. Urvoye has got his lady with him right here named Miriam, who's absolutely stunning and lovely. And so, are you guys married? Yeah, we married a year ago. Oh well, congratulations on that. And she's from Guadalajara. Guadalajara. We'd ask you, my dear, but you're not on the mic. They probably won't hear you. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so that that was the real motivation. Yeah. What year did you move to Mexico? So it was 2010. Oh, okay, very good. And how old a guy are you, by the way? 31. 31. Same okay. as James, right? Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. All right. So cool. So you, I mean, but you uh, you enjoyed here in Mexico. We we talked about this for a while yesterday. Kind of the pros pros and cons, I think, right? But Overall, you've been having a, a good time. You know, I've never been to Guadalajara. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you should, you should come down. Guadalajara is the second biggest uh, city in Mexico. They call it the drug laundering capital of Mexico, <laughs> not to put anyone off. And, and in the, the pro of that is usually if they keep their, the, the bad guys keep their families there, they, it, they tend to keep it a bit more quiet. You know, don't mess with the families. That's the, that's the legend around town. That's so. what they say about this area, too. Yeah. Exactly. And so, Guadalajara, I mean, there's a lot going on. You have world-class conferences, concerts. Um, Do you know about how many people are there? What is it? Like five? I'd like to say five million. Five million. Wow. I think in okay, the, so it's a big in city, the huh? city center, it might be three or four. Okay. But then with the yeah, bigger sure. metropolitan area, it can go up to five. Well, all right. It's a huge, yeah, big city. That, the infrastructure is a bit outdated, so there's a good okay. deal of traffic. Um, Not too far away from the beach? No, the closest beach is, let's say, three hours three away. Three hours, okay. Vallarta's four. Okay. Population, city center, 1.5 million. And the metro about four point four million. Okay, okay there, there you go. go. Big city. Yeah. So it's a yeah, it's a good sized city. Cool. And uh, so, are there a lot of um, are there expats there or young people or what's the, what is the demographic like? Yeah. So you have forty five minutes away, Chapala, Lake Chapala. Oh, right. Oh, that's the yeah. biggest um, community of American expats anywhere in the world. I think there's. Yeah, but they're all like eighty years retirees. old. Retirees. Yeah. yeah. I think there's like. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's like twenty to thirty thousand of them, Canadian American. Uh, so you have that community. Yeah, there's a lot of young people in Guadalajara. There's a lot of entrepreneurship, a lot of stuff going on. Um, you know, every other person I know now has started their own Uber. 
mm-hmm. business. Um, oh, right. So. You, so you were telling me about this yesterday. That's interesting. I didn't realize that you could do this. So explain a little bit about how that works. Right. So, I mean, I just learned about Uber as well. You know, I just got a smartphone a few months ago. So Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, I know so, about Uber, but I mean, right. they buy a car and then... Right. So a lot of people I know is... Because that's the thing about Guadalajara and we work at the tech. We're around a lot of business, you know, the middle class, upper middle class. And they have all they have a number of business, businesses, these people. You mm-hmm. know, real estate, they buy homes, they rent them out. And then they do this stuff like Uber. And so what they do is they buy a car if they can afford it with cash, they buy a second or third car, uh, or but most of the people I know, they purchased it on credit. So they get a car, they register with Uber, which takes a few months to register with uh, Uber, and then you gotta find a driver for your car, and then the driver has to go through a rigorous uh, exam with Uber to make sure you know he knows how to drive and mm-hmm. everything's legit. Right. And so once you get a car and a driver that will work for you, he drives your, he'll drive your car around Guadalajara and people will just, with the Uber app, you know, uh, pick that up. And you get a percentage. So and you so, get, and that's from, like monthly cash flow. That's great. Yeah, monthly cash flow. From what I heard, you pay, I don't know the percentages, 20 to 40% to Uber, 40% goes to the driver, and then you get whatever is left over. Okay. So, so you, they're not getting a lot of... Uh, protests or angry stuff. Well, in Mexico City, weren't they rioting about this or something? Well, they've just recently uh, had... Uh, they're trying to negotiate and work something out. I don't know how that's going to work, but uh, yeah, they were... You know, they they, they did make... Thre- the, the taxi unions did make threats towards Uber, and then... But they they have said to come to some sort of a negotiation where they're going to pay a... Um, they are going to pay taxes to the local government, and then... What was it? They have to get a some sort of a special license each car, but I don't think that that's been completely ironed out yet. But no, I just read an article about it, and it's still nothing's ironed out. So yeah, yeah. And I heard uh, another thing, kind of related, uh, but not related, is uh, I was reading this article yesterday. I guess uh, Hillary Clinton said that's going to be part of her platform is to try to you know, uh, really crack down on this sharing Uh, economy. (laughs) Yeah. Out of concern for the safety of the (laughs) people. (laughs) That's what it is. Oh, my. It's a million dollars to get a medallion, a license to drive a cab in New York City. It's, yeah. You know, it's it's about the safety. Yeah. Yeah. So Uh, that's that's a great platform. Yeah, people probably vote for because of that platform, you know, who knows. But And and that kind of relates, like, if I were a taxi driver, you know, this is a free market innovation. Times are changing get with the program, you know, yeah. why protest, get your own Uber. Exactly. You know, and, and it goes with, with my field in education. The big similar shifts are happening in education. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of teachers who are doing the same thing they've done for 20 years. Yeah. And I've got no problem, you know, if, if I'm, you know, behind the times, you know, fire me. I don't care. Maybe right. I should be doing something else. But, you know, that's what you got to do. I, I'm, I'm innovating and I'm trying to re- reinvent myself. Right. Yeah. So this is something I, I like to talk a lot about is because I really think that education is one of these markets that really needs to be innovated. And it's tough because, you know, the government controls so much of it. But uh, just this morning, I, I put out a, a blog post about a guy that um, he was in a uh, he was homeless. He had his, he was um, from Egypt. He, his house burned down. And he was in a uh, shelter, and they had a, a computer there. So he was using the computer, and he used Khan Academy, and mm-hmm. he missed nine years of high school yeah. and, and middle school. And he was able to catch up, and he went to Queens College and eventually to uh, Columbia, you know, just through uh, going online through Khan Academy. So, you know, that, that's amazing, all the different uh, tools that are there. You know, you can practically uh, teach yourself anything through YouTube and all kinds of different courses, all these different uh, – Top level Ivy League colleges mm-hmm. uh, have all of their curriculum, have all of their uh, lectures from these world class uh, people online that you can watch, you know, at uh, your leisure. And uh, so it's incredible. You know, another thing is uh, I talk a lot about is the Duolingo. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's great. I don't know if you've heard about this, but I've it's heard a, about it, but I don't remember what it's it. a language learning app. Mm-hmm. It's probably like the the one of, if not the the uh, fastest growing applications in the world and websites. That uh, kind of gamifies you learning the language. Um, you know, it makes a game out of it and stuff like that, and it's it's free. So and, and gamif- actually, that's what I'm doing in my classes. I yeah. noticed that on your website. Huh? But are you talking about gamification for applications like this, or in some other? Oh, oh you mean gamification? Yeah, yeah. That's something I'm going to begin next semester with my mm-hmm. classes is gamifying the class and creating an atmosphere, a game atmosphere, mm-hmm. as a way 
basically to motivate the students. So the class stays the same, but in the background, it's kind of like a video game. And the guys who have implemented it correctly say it, you know, it increases up to 70% the student um, interaction. Yeah. Beautiful. So that's that, another trend. In that's education. awesome. I mean, it seems like you really put uh, effort into, you know, what you're giving these kids and stuff like that. Um, for instance, I know you brought a whole bunch of interesting people to do interviews with your right. uh, classes. Maybe you can give some examples of some people that you brought in. Yeah, I mean, th- that's what I was mentioning before, that you got the teachers who aren't doing anything new. And you just got to stay ahead of the game, like what you guys are doing here with, you know, with Borderless. And so it was about four, when I just came to the tech, you know, I read a lot of these geopolitical authors, you know, you, you know, some of the names, Paul, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, the mm. founder oh, wow. of Reaganomics, uh, Ray McGovern, retired CIA, who briefed the president, um, seven presidents daily. Um, James Bamford, who wrote the book on the NSA and one of the few people to who, to have been able to interview Edward Snowden recently. Um, you know, the names go on. William Engdahl. And yeah, so... Uh, Chris, Lord Christopher Mockton. Lord right? Christopher Mockton. You had these guys in your class? No, through Skype. Oh, So, okay. so what Still. I decided was, you know, I was teaching material in international relations, U.S. politics, uh, environment and international relations. So I shoot emails to some of these guys and say, hey, I'm a teacher, professor at the tech. Uh, would you like to join us through video Skype, my class and I? And most of them said, yeah. And I started, you know, they, they would talk to our class for half hour, one hour. I'd record the sessions and put them up on YouTube. And I did that sporadically. And then I saw I got, after a couple of years, 30,000 YouTube views, which isn't mm-hmm. bad. And I, I was just putting them out there. And then finally, this year, I decided I might as well make a regular podcast out of it. There you go. And it's going, it's going great. Oh, well, I didn't know that. You got a podcast? I started uh, about a month ago. Oh. And yeah, it's, 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 go, it's taken off. So Good work. But how cool is that? Huh? I would love to be in that class. You know, you get some really cool people. That you, and you get, they get to ask questions of the class and stuff. And yeah, the, the students read their work, and then they right. get to talk to the author. A lot, of, a lot of them argue with folks like Moncton, <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's good. I used to argue. That was all I did in college, so that's great. Argue with people, the professors. Well, let's, uh, let's take a break here. We've got one sponsor to the Borderless Podcast, and uh, we need to uh, say thank you to them. Today's Borderless Podcast is brought to you by the Condescending Group, your go-to authority for when to be offended. You know, the folks at the Condescending Group hate to put it this way, but they're just better than the rest of us. And it's not that they like it that way. No. It can truly be a burden having to show us inferior nitwits how to be. And it's not that they chose this position of moral superiority for themselves. Hardly. You see, this status was conferred upon them when the great gray pussycat appeared during an ayahuasca session in the Beaver Lake Mountains of Western Oregon. They were christened by a smear of period blood on their faces and thereby coronated as the cultural elite of the first four planets of the Milky Way galaxy. So the next time you're at their website, thecondescendinggroup.com, try and remember the gravity of the lofty responsibility they bear as our moral, spiritual, and societal compass. And maybe send them some Bitcoin. The Condescending Group, they care more than you. Okay, so we're back to the Borderless Podcast. We've been talking to Ervoye Morik, originally from Chicago. He is Croatian. His folks are from Croatia, and he's spent time there. He was in the Peace Corps in uh, Mongolia. He was in Switzerland, and he is presently in, uh, here in, uh, in Mexico, in Guadalajara, as a humanities teacher and adjunct professor of international relations at Tecnológico de Monterrey. So what's next, James? Where do you want to take this? Well, you know, I think that's pretty interesting that you you talk to all these different people. You obviously have looked into geopolitics and stuff like that. You know about the topics that we're, that we talk about in the podcast as far as how technology is affecting, you know, um, education like you're talking about and business and where people live and how they have, have their bank accounts and corporations and stuff like that. After talking to all these people, I mean, what do you think? What, what type of uh, trends do you see in the future? Are, are we seeing a big change like this information age? This, is this mean that we're going into a whole different world or, or um, is it not going to be such a swift change as some people think? What do, what do you think? Well, what I can tell you from some of the folks that I've talked to, well, we were talking about this earlier. It's, it's slightly uh, off that topic, but um, I spoke with Morris Berman over, over the weekend, who's this uh, cultural historian. He left the U.S. around 2004, and I was citing to you as well as a recent interview with Hugo Salinas Price, who's the Mexican billionaire. 
And I found it interesting because I left in 2005. Morris Berman left in 2004. And he wrote these books on why America failed. And Hugo Salinas Price left in 2005. And so one trend I picked up from a lot of these guys, even Paul Craig Roberts, who's like 70 years old now, and he said, you know, he's old, he's, he's old and he doesn't care. You know, he, he lives in the States, but he said if he were my age, he'd probably leave, leave, leave the States. So one trend I can pick up is a lot of folks are leaving, either leaving the U.S. or telling people to leave <laughs> and, and go to places like Mexico, which are, you know, kind of like emerging markets. So there's a trend there to, to go leave the U.S. and Europe, perhaps, and go to you know, Asia, go to Africa, uh, Latin America. So that's one trend. And then the technology is helping us uh, to do that, you know, with, with this podcasting and the Skype, the, the Skype in my classroom with you can do anything now. So that was one trend. And then the other trend, I spoke to William Engdahl a week or two ago who went to the conference in St. Petersburg, the Russian Davos, the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. And he basically said the East is there's a, the, the birth of a new Russia and that the East is rising um, and so that's another trend as well. There's a lot of opportunity um, to the east. You know, it used to be go west, young man, go go really, really, you know, far west. Well, that, that was kind of a point I, I enjoyed from Olav uh, Dirkmat, who we had on the podcast. Um, I mean, obviously, China has suffered a, a huge, you know, uh, this this was, was significant this drop, and yet at the same time, he says fundamentally the way they think and operate, he believes in them as capitalists more than people in other parts of the world, and that includes the West. And so even though this was significant, he believes that he'd be willing to invest in them again, as he's, and yet he's very cautious about investing in places out West here. You know, you know I, I have kind of this idea that what we're seeing is uh, these, like you're talking about these high levels of debt, is because, you know, especially Western countries, they're not being able to function at the way that they, they used to. Uh, we're seeing a slow process of just a, a change in kind of governance, mm -hmm. right? Um, people with a lot of money have known how to work internationally for a long time, work through corporations, use these laws. That's the way that the tax laws are set up in order for certain people to pay less taxes and normally the, the working man to pay most, you know? And uh, so now it's getting more and more accessible to the, you know, the public, you know, people like us. And this is the type of things that I try to uh, explain to people and help people with. And um, so it seems to me that just their, their way of extracting resources from people, uh, do, it, it's not viable anymore uh, because it's, it's more complicated for them to come after somebody when they, have, uh, when they can just move their bank account through, a, through the um, a click of a button. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they don't know where, some, you know, if someone's incorporated over here, they're able to do, you know, if they're living over here as a, as a tourist, but they have uh, citizenship in another country. And, you know, it's not as easy for, um, for one jurisdiction to come and, and uh, extort you in that way. So that we're basically seeing like a breakdown of that type of system and that in the future, what we're going to see is, Governments that have to attract people, you know, that that rather than treating their uh, citizens as slaves or employees where they tell them what to do and they take all their money, whether they like it or not, they're going to have to attract people by having, you know, whether it's good programs or, you know, low <clears throat> taxation or whatever, however it is that they fund their government, um, that we're going to see more of that. So, you know, now we have small, like, micro nations that do it, you know, whether it's Monaco or mm -hmm. St. Kitts and stuff like that. And, and it does. That's what happens. You know, look at Hong Kong and stuff. Mm -hmm. It attracts, you know, very productive people and, and companies, and it becomes very uh, expensive because there's so there's very small places that do that now. But I, I think that there might be a, a trend going in that direction. What do you think about that? Yeah, I would, I would agree. Places in Latin America, perhaps as well. You have both trends. You have places like this that you're talking about, and then other places like the U.S. and Europe where the governments are, are just getting bigger as the economy collapses and becoming more authoritarian and trying to milk you for as much as possible. So you want to try to get out of those juris jurisdictions mm -hmm. and go to the more uh, freer places that have more entrepreneurial uh, opportunities, like yeah. Mexico or you got Chile, a bunch of places in, in Latin America, again, Asia. Uh, smaller places like that, frontier markets, Mongolia. Okay. So you started a podcast recently. 
we know why you wanted to start it. So what went into actually making that happen? What did you have to do? Well, I looked around at other podcasts and, and as well as Borderless. Hmm. You know, you just kind of take in the general um, structure. So I, I knew I wanted to start a regular podcast. And what what is the topic? What's the basic idea of your podcast? Oh, just pick the brain of all of these these interesting people. I don't hmm. agree with everything they, they say, but it's unconventional, out of the box, and it gives you a closer perspective to what's really happening in the world. You know, we talk about geopolitics, we talk about economics, we talk about, you know, maybe in some cases, business opportunities, um, all, yeah. all kinds of stuff across okay. the board. So what are some of the, the lessons that you've learned now? You know, I think you said something about WordPress that you started with without WordPress. Right, yeah. So, you know, in 2011, I started a website. Um, because again, I had this passion, perhaps like you guys, you want to get something out, you ha get it off your chest. And I went in three months from zero to 20,000 visitors in 2011, no, right. but I, I, I did it through HTML and it was, I didn't, I'm not a coder and it was a lot of work and I had my regular job. And so I just shut it down. I couldn't handle it, mm -hmm. but that showed me that I could succeed. Mm -hmm. And so I picked up this podcasting. Uh, a month ago, and I, I registered with, with WordPress.com, and I, I started hosting the audio files on WordPress. Yeah. But then I realized that's not the way to go. Right. And so quickly, I, I opened a SoundCloud account. I know you can choose between Libsyn mm -hmm. and, and SoundCloud, and I preferred SoundCloud. They re they just a few months ago they officially opened their uh, podcasting service. So uh, my files are now hosted on SoundCloud. And I'm going to switch from WordPress.com to, to self-hosted WordPress yeah. mm -hmm. at the end of the year, which is pretty much, if you look at the market, the industry, that's the way to go. I Absolutely. Think. I think it, it's over 60% of all websites, web traffic in the world is on <laughs> WordPress. So, yeah, you, you, want, you want to do a self-hosted WordPress site no matter what you're doing. And if you want to do a podcast, you do want to have another hosting, whether I use Libsyn or, you know, you could use SoundCloud, whatever it is, because... Uh, WordPress can mess it up, and there's a number of things that can happen. Uh, what was it that happened to you that made you realize that you needed to self-host? Uh, well, um, you know, the limit for, for the amount of audio you could host was right. 13 gigabytes. Yeah. Mm. Um, and then it might be slower for your website if mm -hmm. people are downloading both the audio f from your website. So yeah. it should be a separate. And as well, the lack of customization. You can't, you know, uh, advertise, I guess, on WordPress.com. Mm -hmm. mm. So... Okay, and do you have a, a, an idea of how you want to what you want to do with this in the future, or monetization, or, or are you just kind of doing it as a, a side thing? Yeah, it's, it's, it, for me, it's not about money. It's just awesome to talk to these people, mm -hmm. to share their knowledge with my students, and as well as the rest of the world. For me, that's you know that's enough. And if it gets uh, bigger, monetize it. You know, through through ads, you've you've got the obligatory YouTube, Google monetization. I have some of that. Um, and maybe later, as it gets bigger, affiliates or some other yeah. advertising. And, and it depends. You know, I, I called it an institute because one of my favorite professors back in Geneva, he set up his own Geneva Institute for Geopolitical Studies, and he holds actual conferences once a year. And so, you know, who knows? Maybe who knows? one day in the future I can yeah. do something similar here in Guadalajara right. and organize conferences with some other yeah. folks. Yeah, we can do something together or something in the future. We'll see. Yeah, at the tech or wherever. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, great. You know, thanks a lot for, for coming on. You know, if anybody wants to uh, check out his stuff, it is GuadalajaraGeopolitics.com, right? Yep. You know, if you were advising somebody that's looking at getting out of the U.S., maybe starting their own business or maybe doing something academia, whatever it is, mm -hmm. what is the best piece of advice that you would give them? Well, know what you want to do. Uh, you know, be passionate about it. D don't use it just as a ticket to, to, to get, out of, get out of Dodge. So do what you like. Uh, get really good at it. It's going to take some time, so be patient. Don't expect to make a lot of money. Um, take your time. Try to get some certification, you know, um, any kind that you can. I, I have an ESL certification as well. Get all of the, the certification that you can and do it as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible as well. You don't have to get the, the expensive stuff. And just travel the world. Look, you know, it's cheap to travel, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. go, go to places, get cheap tickets, check them out. See if that's that's what you like, and you and in my case, I, I didn't come to Mexico. I got hired, and then they brought me here, so I had no idea what it was like. 
Uh, and that's another option. If you get a job um, from abroad, you, you can do that as well. Look for jobs mm-hmm. where they fly you out and you land there with a paying right. gig. That's another option. Yeah. And, and network. So that's another thing. We're talking with a lot of these people on my podcast. Some of them have in, invited me to, to hang out with them. Um, and so, again, if you're doing what you like and you're good at it and you're passionate, a lot of doors will open. Great. Well, great advice. Thank you very much, Ervoye Morik, for being on the Borderless Podcast. Okay, so it was good having Ervoye here. You, you, he, he contacted you, James, or you contacted him? Yeah, he contacted me from the, from the website. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And uh, so there's just another type of story quite different from any other we've heard so far, I yeah, think. Yeah, all kinds of uh, different people that come through San Miguel. So it's, uh, it's, it's very exciting. And uh, our audience, you know, the audience here in the Borderless podcast is growing, the Borderless Network. So we really appreciate all the people that um, reaches out to us and, uh, you know, gives us feedback on our shows. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, if, if this is the first time listening to the podcast, please go to the uh, website. It's borderlesspodcast.com. And uh, there's a giant button on the top of the screen there. I'm giving all kinds of things to people that sign up on the email list. You know, I'll, uh, you get access to the Borderless Network private Facebook group. You also get an ebook that has all these different online resources that'll help you uh, find a place that might be good for you. And uh, also, uh, it has an application for a free 20-minute consultation if you're stuck somewhere on your journey if you're trying to get out of the states or you're trying to start your own business maybe set up a company or a bank account uh, we have all different types of uh, contacts here people that we've talked to and also you know i've been working in the business for about seven years now so uh, i will uh, you know we can talk on skype or something for about 20 minutes and and please join us on the network and let us know uh, what you think about the show all right so another borderless podcast coming up soon thanks for joining us for the borderless podcast traveling, investing, and living beyond borders.